Thanks, John, for the, the lovely introduction. And thanks to Anthony Zicola for inviting me here. Um, Anthony, and Anthony and I worked at my first game company over a decade ago, so that makes us old. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, as was mentioned earlier, um, I'm originally um, an East Coast native, so, um, but I've been living in Southern California for the past 15 years, so I was a little apprehensive about the weather coming out here. Uh, you know, it only made national news, so I was a little bit worried. <laughs> and um, uh, I came prepared. I actually brought, I would say, three different jackets, one for uh, rain, one for insulation, uh, one for adulting. And uh, I, was, I was packing and getting ready for this trip, and I noticed um, I even managed to fit my travel yoga mat in my little stroller. And I was looking at it, and um, I just had to admire the, the packing. Um, I was sitting there looking at my luggage and just one thought came to mind. I said, suitcase packing level, KonMari. <laughs> and you're probably asking, okay, is she gonna stop talking about her suitcase? But if you think about it, um, the suitcase could be a metaphor for game production because uh, you have anticipation and anxiety for preparation, you have um, organization, where is everything gonna go? You have capacity that you have to think about, like is it all gonna fit? Can we, can we bring it all? You have the, uh, the anxiousness of am I gonna forget something? And I guess my luggage has uh, those spinning wheels, it's a spinner, so you can put it in any direction. I'm like, agile, agile development, you got it all right there. Um, no, but all joking aside, um, there's a little bit more to game production than that. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and, and talk a little bit more about that. Oh, did I press a button? I pressed a button. I should be careful with this thing. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to throw out a disclaimer first to say that um, while most of what I have to share is just based off of my own personal experience, I'm not a single source of truth for game production. It's very healthy to take a look at um, game development through the eyes of multiple um, perspectives and different lenses, and that's an important theme that I'll, I'll touch upon in a little bit. Um, so, um, as mentioned, uh, in the past 11 years, I've been working on games, primarily MMOs for the PC platform, um, but I've worked uh, large, many years for um, games as a live service, and also spent many years in um, free-to-play games. And I've worked on all sorts of genres, um, I've worked on MMOs that were rated T for teen uh, fantasy RPGs to rated M for mature shooters. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of different um, uh, types of MMOs that I've had a chance to work on, fortunately. Um, and this is the, the new MMO I'm working on, New World. Um, so with uh, Amazon Game Studios, uh, Orange County. So let's see if I can do this. The right one, okay. All right, so just a quick overview. Um, wanted to talk about all of the various production roles that are out there in the industry. Um, what kind of um, career paths are there within game production? Uh, and uh, next, want to go into publishing versus development. Now, um, in doing a little bit of research for this event, I was trying to take a look at what was already out there because, you know, as a game industry, as a community, we often try to boost each other up and try to add uh, value to where we've been before, whether that's in technology or art, we're always constantly pushing the envelope to try to give a little bit more. Um, so I wanted to be able to talk on a subject that I don't, didn't really see a lot, of, a lot out there on this, this type of narrative. Um, a lot of the talks you may see from producers at GDC will mostly focus on, you know, uh, specific things, maybe even technical skills towards uh, production. And I kind of wanted to talk about some experiences that I've had even recently in my career, um, working on both uh, publishing and development, and kind of what the differences and similarities are. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, general skills to develop, um, I still don't want to leave that out there. I think um, those are some important topics we can go over. And lastly, um, and this is the, the, the important theme that I really wanted to, to end on, which is um, 
cultivating a culture of inclusivity. So, I'll get to that. Okay, so <laughs> in the past 10 years or more, um, there's two common questions that I often get asked. Um, and the first is, well, what's a producer? Um, oftentimes this question will come from you know, people that I meet or you know, acquaintances that focus, maybe, maybe they're not as familiar with the games industry or maybe they're not as even familiar with games, uh, like my parents who I'm still trying to explain what I do for a living. Um, and the second one, which often gets asked, uh, is how do I become a producer? The funny thing is, once this second question gets asked, it often goes back to the first one of what is a producer? What does a producer do? Um, funny enough, um, so the majority of my, the bulk of my experience has been on the publishing side. And I've worked with organizations that have focused solely on the publishing aspect of the business and working with outside or external or partner developers. And then um, also, I've been in organizations where publisher and developer are one in the same business entity, um, and then also working on just purely development. Uh, but depending upon what situation I was in, whether I was on, on the publishing side or the development side, or what my specific job title could be, this question would never have the same answer. So I'll go through some of the, the various rules. So I started off as assistant producer. Um, we're just gonna work our way up the chain, associate producer. Sometimes these are interchangeable, one and the same. You'll often find these titles on both the development and the publishing side. Uh, producer, senior producer, um, even senior to senior producer, production director, development director. These are just generic titles. Uh, executive producer, kind of at the top of the food chain. Um, so these are some other variants of producer. So production manager, product manager, project manager, technical producer, live ops producer, creative producer. It's like a, a word garden I got going on here. Broadcast producer, um, you'll find this role very relevant for things like esports right now or live events, streaming events and um, insert feature producer. So on the development side, when you're working on a game, you may often work with multiple producers on any given project, and they may be in charge or own a specific feature set of that game. So for example, um, you may have an animation producer or an audio producer or a combat producer um, and so forth, cinematics producer. Um, the other, I think out of this um, grouping, uh, production manager, producer, uh, product manager, those are kind of the titles that I've owned in the past. And I even had one title that was um, manager, comma, production. I didn't know this, but commas are actually, I guess, an uh, important thing in the corporate world. I didn't know until I had one. But yes, if you have a comma in your title, it may be good. Um, so publishing versus development. Um, we're talking about two sides of the business that do have differences, but they also have a lot of similarities. And I'll, I'll speak to that from the production standpoint. Um, so one major difference is on the development side and on the publishing side, you may be working with different teams. You may be interfacing with very specific disciplines, depending upon what side you're working on. Um, working with different metrics um, as a producer on the publishing side, there were a lot of uh, what we call key performance indicators or KPIs that we would have to be accountable for um, and see how the game grows. Um, and then just the overall business function, the differences between publishing and development. Um, and this is an important note. Um, producer is a servant leader, um, regardless of what side of the business you're on, you are first and foremost, a support role to your teams and to your player community, and then you are also a leader as well. Okay, so the first thing we talked about was what are some of the different teams that you'll be interfacing with as a producer? Um, and kind of when there, where there's some overlaps between um, 
the development side and the publishing side. I'm sorry, it's a little bit messy, but um, you'll see, I haven't done a Venn diagram, I think, since elementary school, so you'll have to excuse the way this looks. But basically, does this thing have a laser? Oh, yes, okay. Um, so on the development side, you will often, as a producer, be working with more creative uh, focused disciplines. So obviously you may be working with concept artists, um, 3D modelers, and 3D modelers will have various specializations sometimes, like character artists, um, environment or artists that work with level designers, or weapon artists, um, uh, vehicle artists. They may be very specific, depending upon what type, type of game you're working on. Uh, POs or product owners, they're usually creative leads that, are, that own whatever feature team. Um, so you may have a, a combat lead or you know, AI lead. Animators, engineers, programmers, VFX, tech art. Um, these are the guys that are rigging, skinning, um, working on tools and pipeline optimization, and audio. Uh, then on the publishing side, we have more of what I would say are uh, more business-centric disciplines. So you'll be working with teams uh, like PR and marketing, um, fraud and investigations, uh, web development, uh, community, um, all of these guys right on the line here. Uh, if you're in an organization that is both a publisher and a developer that are one in the same business entity, um, you may be interfacing with these teams as well. Um, customer support, product management, uh, GMs, game masters. And in the middle, this, this is pretty much a center stone. These, got, these teams, they're in everybody's business, so you will always talk to them. Um, QA, very big. Um, honestly, one, one thing about QA, no one will ever know or play your game and be the experts at it better than QA. They are testing that game eight hours a day. That's pretty much their, their focus. So if you end up having some sort of play test where there's a competitive aspect, you'll want the QA person to be on your team, just saying. Um, production, um, we're right in the middle. Um, we're basically the hub of communication. We make sure that things are flowing, that people are aligned, that we are moving things forward and closing. Uh, legal as well and finance uh, kind of fall into both. Um, maybe even more so on the publishing side because, um, for example, when you're working on a live service game and let's say you have a collaboration with a, an IP from a different company and you're doing some sort of license collaboration, you will be working a lot with finance and legal. Um, and then on the development side, let's say you're working on a game but you want to license some new technology to help in your development like uh, using specific software that requires licensing, you're gonna go straight to uh, finance and legal. Um, server platform and DevOps. So these teams, um, on the development side, you're really going to be focusing on working with these uh, teams to make sure, one, your game is performant. If you're a live service game that you have the proper reporting, um, you will be monitoring those type of uh, metrics like 24-7 and making sure you know everything's up and running uh, on the publishing side these are the guys that will be calling you at uh, 3 in the morning when the you know channels start crashing and you know things need to be fixed so this is on the publishing side okay and then we talked about the difference in metrics so as um, as a producer on the on the publishing side, oh, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, on the publishing side, there's certain, um, certain metrics, certain KPIs that you will own, you will follow closely, you'll need to know inside and out, like the back of your hand. Um, LTV, lifetime value, um, this is the lifetime uh, value of a player to your game. And when we're talking about live service and MMOs, this is, um, how, what is, what is the value uh, a single player will bring to your game community? Uh, retention rates. Now this is, um, as a live service game, you're up 24 seven. So you pretty much wanna be able to know, are people coming back to the game? Are they still having fun? Uh, you 
we'll probably be looking at these on various cadences. So daily, weekly, monthly, it will kind of show. When you're running a game as a live service, you may be doing things to um, fluctuate those type of metrics. For example, you may be running a limited time holiday event where um, you're trying to see, okay, well, is this working? Are people coming back? Are they continually going? Are they enjoying this event? Was it better than last year's? So you will always be looking at those. Uh, MCCU and PCCU. So this is minimum uh, concurrent user. PCU is uh, peak concurrent user. So sometimes you may be doing things, again, to fluctuate the performance of the game and see what players are doing. And um, these, these are metrics you might want to look at as a result of after you've done done your promotion or events. Uh, now these metrics down here, honestly they're more uh, geared towards what I would say free to play because uh, you, there are players that are can play the game for free for, for however long they want. They don't necessarily have to pay anything. Um, but uh, usually with free-to-play uh, MMOs, there are some microtransaction and um, monetization, DLC, even for subscription games uh, now these, nowadays or, or um, early access games, you'll notice there are still DLC that you can purchase and that will affect these right here. So I'll just run by them real quickly. Uh, conversion rate is, again, for mostly free-to-play, um, does the player become a paying customer? Uh, ARPU, average revenue per user. This word is pretty funny. So acronyms, they kind of vary from company to company. Some people call this ARPPU, some people call it ARPU or ARPUPU. Um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. So this is average revenue per paying user. And in the mobile world, uh, this is uh, a metric that they more closely follow, which is average revenue per daily active user, uh, ARPDAO. Yeah, I know, they sound funny. Uh, then on the development side, so as a producer on the development side, um, you're going to be focusing on a lot of other metrics too. Um, certain areas of measurement that you want to report to um, your leadership team to, to give them a gauge of how's the project going. Um, so one big thing, um, on the development side is getting an idea of estimates for the scope of your work. Like you have blue skies and you know designers and creative leads that want to do everything. They want to put everything into the game that they're working on. And they often get different ideas and not necessarily consider the complexity or the scope of what they want to make um, initially. But so in order to do that, and in order to give them the space to do their best work, um, you want to be able to uh, follow metrics like story point estimates, uh, t-shirt sizing, uh, min-max confidence intervals. These are various ways of trying to gauge scope for a project and to make sure that you actually have the bandwidth and the capacity and the time to do all of those crazy ideas that everybody wants to see uh, get, go into the game. Um, and then on top of that, once you have these in, in place, you also want to kind of take a look at your team's velocity. Um, this is especially important when we get into bug crunching mode where we're about to release um, like a big update for the game and we want to make sure that things are polished and we're closing out and getting ready to ship. And so we want to be able to have um, an idea of velocity of how fast is the team able to fix all of the bugs that are coming in um, based off of our bandwidth, based off of how many are, are being reported. Um, so those are some metrics. Okay, and now just the overall differences and similarities between the publishing and the development um, as a business function, business um, entity. So I've noticed just from my personal um, experience that, and oh, 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 the, um, on the publishing side, there's a little bit of overlap here. You kind of have to be both. Uh, as a producer working on a live game, you have to have the ability to be reactive because things can go wrong and you have to stay, keep a cool head um, when, I don't know, your game might be getting DDoSed or again, servers are crashing. So being reactive and 
getting all the information, collecting it, and making sure that you have what you need to make a good decision for the live service. Um, being reactive is definitely uh, some a more inherent trait, I would say, that comes out in your day-to-day -day work on the publishing side. On the development side, it's almost always it's almost too late once you've become reactive. Like on the development side, you have to be even more proactive. It's about planning. It's about knowing where your team's going to land, when they're going to be ready to ship. Um, and yeah, missing a deadline uh, really sucks. So um, being proactive, being ahead of the problem, um, those are the things that you will be dealing with on the day to day. Um, and then as I mentioned, as you saw from some of the different disciplines, teams. Uh, on the publishing side, you're going to be interfacing with a lot more business-centric teams. And then on the development side, you may be working with more creatives. Um, so let's see, what's, what do I have here? As a business function, too, um, we're talking about managing a live service. So this, is, this goes beyond like just creating the content for the game. Like Once the game is there, you're talking about uh, players, you're talking about customer service and supporting them for that. Um, and on the development side, you're more focused about delivering milestones. You are more focused on that content. Um, I kind of likened this analogy to um, a restaurant where publishing is kind of the front of house and development is in the kitchen. So that's, that's my metaphor. Um, other metaphors, suitcase, kitchen. Um, and lastly, we talked about producer as a servant leader. I think another commonality that you should really know and understand is industry trends. On the publishing side, you may be working with a web development team that's getting ready to help you promote with your marketing team a brand new expansion for your game. And you, know, you may be designing landing pages for that to drive traffic and knowing like, okay, well, these, this style of website may be a little bit more minimalist is, is the thing now we should be focusing on what, where we're trending. And on the development side, knowing what technology is out there, what are people leveraging right now? What is kind of the, the style that you're going on? What is the emergent gameplay that is starting to happen right now as more games become live service games? Okay. And on to skills to develop. Uh, the number one thing, and this goes for both sides of the business, is putting first things first. Um, it's, it's a walking a fine line. You're kind of balancing between this thousand foot view and being in the trenches with the guys. And um, it's, it's hard, but you have to keep your eye on both. You have to know, you have to be in the know, you have to be in the details, but you also really need to be the one to be able to step back and take uh, take a look at the bigger picture because everybody else is going to be so focused on their discipline and what they're doing. Uh, communication. This is, this is a big thing. I know it's pretty generic, but you as a producer are the hub of the communication. So you really need to know your audience. You need to know how to read a room. When you get into a meeting room, um, who's there? Who, who, what is the point of discussion? Um, so interestingly enough, working on the publishing side, I worked with a lot of global teams. So we would be in different time zones. Uh, we would maybe have a different primary languages. And I tend to have developed a habit of written communication because, OK, the time difference, we're not necessarily going to get on a call together or we're not in the same room. But having that track record and that paper trail was really helpful. Um, I found that actually is a little bit counterproductive to working in a um, development studio where your team is right there and maybe you should be just getting up out of your chair and going to have some more face-to-face -face communication. That may be a little bit more productive. Um, having a paper trail and good documentation is still important, but it's not necessarily the primary uh, form of communication you may want to go with. So. All of these things are very important channels, but you just really need to know to leverage in which specific situation is going to be the best way to communicate with your teams. Um, for example, they, when I first started in publishing, uh, they mentioned, OK, if you're sending an email to an executive, make it no more than three bullet points, because that's literally 
the attention span. They're very busy, just three bullet points. Okay, great. I've noticed nowadays, it doesn't matter if you're an executive or not, everybody on your team has a set amount of uh, attention span when it comes to emails. Um, some companies are a little bit more spam adverse than others, but if it starts to become more than like a half a page, you may wanna consider putting it in a central place like a document or like a wiki for your team. So organization and process. Um, obviously, this is a key um, skill set that you want to develop as a producer. Um, there's several various project management software out there um, like Jira or uh, Shotgun. Um, just whatever your team is using, make sure that um, you know the ins and out of it. Like you should be a master pro, pro user for those. Um, and pipelines and workflows, having a clear understanding of what te every team does on their day-to-day, -day, how do their disciplines um, work, because you will be part of trying to own optimizing what they do on the day-to-day. -day. Um, humility, curiosity, and trust. Um, now we're getting a little bit more generic, but I really feel like these are huge characteristics that you should try to develop uh, as a producer, no matter what um, specific production role you're in. If you don't know something, that's fine. Um, you have your teams there and you know you have people that are experts in their craft and you should lean on them for their expertise. So humility in terms of you may not always have the, the answer. You should be the leader to help guide them and have buy-in from the team. And uh, with that commitment and buy-in from the team, help continue to drive things in that direction. Um, but you may not always have the answers. Um, curiosity. Um, one of my favorite uh, leadership principles at Amazon is always be curious. And I think that even after over a decade of working in games, there's still so much that I have to learn. And I always feel like that's a key aspect that you know you should you should have. You should be curious. Like there's new technology that ha um, ha uh, sorry becomes available all the time. And how, how could your team leverage those? Uh, you may not be an artist specifically, or you may not be an audio designer, but you should know like, oh, well, what kind of tools are you using? Um, how does the thing that you make, that asset, get into the game? Like, you should know that. You should want to know that. And trust, of course. Um, another Amazon principle is earn trust. Um, I think that's very key because you're, as again, a servant leader, as someone who's supporting your teams, as well as leading them, you wanna earn their trust. Letting go and failing fast. Uh, this is key. A lot of the times um, in game development, you may start off with a vision of something and it may not work out the way that you want. And so, but you have, most of us have, don't have unlimited time and unlimited budget. So you wanna be able to iterate quickly and whatever you could do to help your teams get in a position where they can iterate quickly, you're doing like 90% of the work as a producer. This is a big one. I underestimate this skill set all the time. Uh, let it shine, all the energy. Basically, because you are the hub of communication and you are in constantly interfacing, like you're, I would say like maybe 80% of my day is going up and talking to somebody. So it doesn't matter if you're having a bad day or <laughs> you're tired, um, you just have to leave it at the door because uh, you being kind of a center of the team and leader, you set the tone, you set a baseline for, uh, for that energy. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And that kind of, leads into the next thing. So because you are, as a producer, setting that tone, setting that energy, setting that baseline for your team, uh, I think it's a key responsibility to be mindful of cultivating culture. And what I mean by cultivating culture is a culture of inclusivity, not just on your team, but also for your player community. Um, funny enough, I noticed coincidentally that a lot of the other uh, uh, discussions earlier today kind of touched upon this. We we're talking about 
um, who buys games. Like uh, there was another discussion for accessibility. And those are, I think it speaks loudly that we are talking about those themes today. And I don't really see too many discussions from developers uh, around this theme. And I think it's gonna become even more prevalent and even more important. So I really wanted to talk about this. Um, as a team leader, you will also be the ones putting out fires, not just on the project, but within the team itself. If there's a certain uh, conflict between team members, you're gonna be the one to interject. And part of the things to recognize is being aware of tribalism and creating barriers. Um, we versus us and them. So short story, I worked in a company where uh, we were a publisher and developer hybrid, kind of both sides, uh, the publishing side not having had too much experience on the development side and the development side having not that much experience on the publishing side and trying to work together with uh, both areas of expertise but with equal ownership. Uh, there were a lot of growing pains initially and when things went wrong, <laughs> um, this was actually a point where I was noticing on our player forums that there was, when things were going wrong, there was an amount of finger pointing uh, type of culture happening. And that was when I immediately knew I had to nip it in the bud because what was happening was uh, something would go wrong in the game and uh, one member of one side of the team, maybe the development side or the publishing side would say, oh, well, you know, that's their problem, um, but we're the good guys still, so you guys are fine. We're, I don't know why they made that decision. And I just came down so hard <laughs> on the team to say, you know what, that's not, we don't talk like that to our player community. We really are one in the same team. We're in this boat together, and um, we shouldn't be f framing uh, us and them. You know, that immediately by doing so, just those simple words, already draws a line in the sand. So please be mindful of that. Um, acknowledging differences. So this is kind of on the opposite side of that spectrum. Like your team is gonna be built up and made up hopefully of a very diverse group where you have um, people from all different backgrounds, all different experiences and all different um, expertise. So it's not really, you don't, while you're still one in the same team, you don't wanna uh, you don't want to kind of uh, disservice acknowledging that there are differences because that's what actually makes for innovative teams. Um, no matter if you're in a tiny startup or you know a behemoth, you really want them to be able to bring what is unique to them to your team. And that's actually where I believe innovation comes from. Okay, this is a big one. Um, actually listening. It's not a matter of just putting down your cell phone. Uh, actually sit there and process what other people are saying when you're in a meeting. For example, you may be in a meeting and you know, quite frankly, not always the loudest person in the room knows the most or has the most to offer. I make it a key point that if I'm in a meeting and um, you know, I could, there could be the most senior person in the room versus the least experienced person in the room. And we want to hear from everyone. We want to hear from everybody in that room and you want to invite that. So um, actually listen. Uh, when, we, when we get in, I've, I've been on teams where people are just, um, they're super passionate about what they do. They're very opinionated. They have um, a lot of things that they want to say about a certain topic. And sometimes meetings can kind of go awry where you know, people are talking over each other and it's like, oh my gosh, we're, we're not really moving the conversation forward now, are we? We're just kind of talking at each other. So listening actually means taking pause, not just waiting till the other person is done so that you can say your piece, like process what they're saying, because um, it could be important or it can bring something to light that would be important to your project. Okay, and, and I talked about this earlier. Um, inclusivity for your teams and, and for your player communities. Um, it goes both ways. I think with the guise of um, being behind the mask, um, the interwebs can be kind of a, a scary place. And so 
it kind of saddens me sometimes when I hear um, players have these very toxic interactions where honestly, if it were, I guess the equivalent would be if you were at a bowling alley and you were face to face, you're, you're playing a game, would you actually say those things to that person or uh, even, even try to make the same type of comments? I don't think so because probably one, maybe you might get arrested or you know there might be a confrontation, but why do we still to this day have those type of uh, interactions uh, with live games? So this is a type of question that I think people should also keep in mind when we're talking about inclusivity and accessibility to the games. We're talking about um, a space that is for everyone. So um, that, was, that was the big note here. Oh. It's kind of out of order. Uh, and value the opportunities to view things through many lenses. So I think I just kind of touched upon that. OK. And I think that was pretty much it. Um, thanks again for having me. And I, I'm honored to be here and speak with all of you. And if any of you have uh, any questions, I'm, I'm available to answer them. Thank you. Hello. Um, I really appreciated the presentation. I was just oh, wondering, thanks. what do you recommend for someone to like start working on, like say if they're like a senior in college, like what they should be doing now to try to like work to become a good publisher, or like on the left side of the Venn diagram? Um, sure. Yeah, I would. I would definitely um, be doing research on your own for. Uh, seeing how industry trends are, are coming into play, following um, certain media or publications like super data research or knowing more about metrics. Uh, it, it helps to have some, I, I didn't have this as my educational background. As I mentioned, I studied film production, but having had uh, maybe more formal training in business education would be very helpful. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Um, I just wanted to ask, as a woman in the game development industry and just games in general, what can all of us do to include more people both and be an ally to everybody in the games community so that everybody's involved? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of different things that uh, we can do on the game development and on the publishing side when we're trying to uh, Sorry, could you re <laughs> repeat the question? Again? Yeah, I just, I just want to know what more can all of us be doing collectively to be sure that everybody, um, people who are mi um, misrepresented and underrepresented in groups, um, to make sure that everybody is getting their shot in the games community. And what more can we all be doing so that everybody's included? Yeah, and one of the biggest things I would say is letting them be heard, um, being acknowledging their presence, um, like I said, when you're in a room, I, I feel like I'm relatively vocal, but there are some people that are much more vocal than I am that sometimes I get a little drowned out, but then I will have allies in the room to say like, I think Myra was trying to say something there like about 10 minutes ago, can, can it be her turn to talk? It's doing things like that, even those gestures are meaningful. Um, and I also think um, on the player side, I mean, treat every player equally. Uh, again, like if you were in person, I mean, there's there's a fine line between how player behavior is you're, you're just a gamer or you're being toxic. And I think being mindful of where that behavior lies is another thing that we can give visibility on. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, my name's Naomi. I'm a junior at Beaumont in oh, Cleveland. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> um, I was wondering what your favorite game that you've worked on is and why. Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, honestly, I have to say I'm really proud of um, the team and what they've been able to um, bring to New World, which is, will be coming out soon. Uh, we're just eager to get it into the hands of customers and see uh, what the reaction will be. So I'm actually highly anticipating uh, New World. Thank so. you. Uh, 
Um, so being on the publishing side, I actually have a question for you about the community aspect. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very common uh, trope now um, and seemingly getting worse and worse um, that uh, there's a big disconnect between um, publishers, developers, and the community as a whole. Um, you have things like, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure the Call of Duty Infinity War trailer is still one of the most disliked videos on YouTube of all time. Um, there just seems to be this really big disconnect between those three parties. Uh, do you think developers should have more of a say on the community aspect? Why or why not? I think for at least uh, for teams that I've been on, I think that is the goal to trend more towards having a more direct connection. I think even if you're focused on the publishing side, you should be as well informed about the product that you are marketing as well as the developer who is actually creating that content. Um, there's an equal responsibility. Uh, I've worked in the past with you know maybe teams or marketing teams that I'm like, have you even logged in once to the game? <laughs> so I think it is a responsibility on both sides. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Oh, hi. It's kind of a loaded question, sort of. Um, what are your thoughts on, from your perspective, on the mass layoffs that seem to be coming up uh, over and over again, especially in the past couple of months, and the effort to uh, unionize the games industry? Do you think that might be just something that's worth our time, or do you think it might there might be better ways to solve that issue? Um, could you go into more depth of what you uh, for layoffs? You're um, talking so about specific I, companies. So there or? was the uh, pretty much the entirety of Telltale Games dissolved uh, last year, towards the end of last year, I know, um, and Activision Blizzard just laid off 800 employees, um, and then we have a, another couple of rounds of major layoffs coming up that have been announced, uh, I think, starting next week. I don't remember what specific companies, but I know that there's a lot of, uh, like, mass layoffs after, uh, in between projects seems to be a consistent thing. Okay, so in regards to layoff, your question was? Um, what are your feelings on, like, um, unionization? Or, and, and do you think there might be a better solution or a different solution that would work just better for the games industry? Yeah, um, it is interesting that you mentioned that um, as it, with any uh, entertainment meets art meets commerce type of industry, uh, you know, we're not in the business of making tires, which people need all the time. It's, it, it can be a very volatile landscape. And even my, I myself have been, have experienced uh, massive layoffs in organizations that I've worked for. And it's, it's never a fun thing. Um, it's always almost a very, uh, traumatizing experience, but I believe that it, it is kind of an interesting um, trajectory there because if you're looking at a the movie industry, like there are unions for that, so I would say there could probably be some benefits. Uh, some there may be pluses and minuses to that. It's hard to say when and where or how that might happen, um, but I do know that. Nowadays, there are a lot of um, a lot more considerations, a lot more you know labor laws that are more considerate for those type of events, um, and I hope that they continue to go that way for sure. Thank you. Yeah. What about the union, unionizing? Amazon doesn't have. Uh, no, I, I'm actually not probably the best person to be asking for <laughs> uh, union type of information, but. Uh, in that regards, I would say yeah, there, there are no uh, unions that, that we have. I was wondering, uh, personally, what has been the greatest difficulty for you in getting into this industry and becoming successful with it, and what have you done to manage that difficulty? Okay, um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, honestly, I would say as, particularly working again in the live games, the games as a, uh, a live service, the biggest difficulty has been managing personal time or work-life balance. Uh, that's, that's a real thing. Uh, I feel like now that I'm on the development side, I have a little bit more distance, but I do also, I'm still involved in the live operations as well. 
uh, that's actually been the biggest struggle by far. <laughs> And earning trust, I would say that's the second most. Uh, I don't come from a background of having been an animator or a scripter or a programmer. So being humble and in, in letting my team know, like, I'm here to help you, I'm here to support you. I may not have the level or even the foundational knowledge for what it is your expertise is. You will tell me I, I'm there to support you. But earning that trust uh, is also a challenge, especially if you don't come from that specific background. You may actually come with, against some challenges with trying to earn that trust. Thank you. <laughs>